The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. All right, Paul, take 20. <laughs> Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, joined by my co-host, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. And on tonight's show, we're going to be talking about cardiorenal syndrome with two wonderful guests, Dr. Joel Toff and Dr. Sadia Khan. But first, Paul, would you tell them, uh, what is it that we generally do on The Curbsiders? Sure. Happy to, as per usual, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. We have no less than two experts with us tonight. Uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Joel Toft and Dr. Sadia Khan, who are going to talk us through the ins and outs of cardiorenal syndrome in anticipation of Neff Madness, um, my favorite chance to feel stupid and lose, um, coming up pretty quickly. And I wanted to remind people that this episode is part of an ongoing pod crawl. So check out the link in the episode description here and check out these other podcasts who are also doing some great Neff Madness content and uh, join the pod crawl. And because we have such a great show, I don't want to get to it. I'll just remind you that our two guests tonight are Dr. Joel Toff. He's our chief of nephrology at Cashlack Memorial Hospital and a new favorite, Dr. Sadia Khan, who is a cardiologist at Northwestern. So without further ado, let's get to our discussion. And I also wanted to remind you that this episode and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And so with that... Let's get on to our discussion with Dr. Toff and Dr. Khan. Joel and Sadia, welcome to the show. Joel, you're our chief of medicine, so I'm going to throw it to you first. Can you remind whoa, the audience, whoa, whoa, give whoa, them a one-liner? I'm, not a, I'm no chief of medicine. I'm no chief, chief of, of medicine. Chief of nephrology. I misspoke. Thank you. How dare I? I, if I got promoted, I didn't. I didn't get the. I didn't get the raise. Is my concern. <laughs> <laughs> You'll double my salary. <laughs> I'm, I'm Joel Toff. I'm a 52 year old uh, male physician, and uh, I live and breathe nephrology. And I've had uh, I've had a blast working with the curbsiders for I don't know four years or so now. It's been great. Yeah, I think at least at least yeah, four years. We'll have to we'll have to go back and check that. Maybe maybe we'll put it in the show notes. But I, I think I, at least four years. <laughs> and Sadia, can you give the audience a one liner about yourself? Sure, I'm a 36 year old cardiologist, epidemiologist, mother of two that spends all my free time watching Encanto recently, over and over and over again. I think that's pretty much everybody with with uh, young kids right now. They, it just and that uh, does that Bruno song in your head all the time, just constantly. That's like everyone's singing it at my house. Wait, am I supposed to be watching it with my kids? I just meant that's what I'm watching all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, we have a huge topic tonight, and Joel, maybe I think a good way to set this up would be to explain. What is Neff Madness and, and why are we talking about cardiorenal? Yeah, so uh, Neff Madness is an online uh, educational game that we play uh, in nephrology. It's displayed across social media. We've been doing this. This is our 10th year of Neff Madness. And what we do is it's a spoof on March Madness, and we take 32 nephrology concepts from eight different academic regions, and we put them in a single elimination bracket, and we pretend that they would have a basketball tournament against each other. And we pair these concepts up, and we have um, we have a blue ribbon panel of experts that will vote to determine the actual winners. But what we ask our audience to do, and the people that want to play Neff Madness, is to read through those 32 concepts, pick your winners, fill out your brackets just like you would for March Madness. You do this at nephmadness.com. And then go on social media and yell about your picks and pick fights with your friends. And uh, we've got a, we got we got prizes for the winners. We've got prizes for the most participation. It's been a lot of fun. Literally, we will have thousands of people around the globe participating in the world's most nerdy March Madness tournament. 
and and this year we have this pod crawl as part of it. So uh, check out in, in the link for this episode, there's links to the other ep- uh, shows that are going to be releasing Neff Madness themed episodes as well um, for other really good topics in nephrology. Prepare for the boards with confidence by registering for one of ACP's board review courses with both in-person and virtual live formats available. ACP's Internal Medicine Board Review is a comprehensive five-day course that is ideal for both residents preparing to take the ABIM certification exam, as well as general internists and subspecialists taking the 10-year MOC exam. These courses include interactive case-based questions and test-taking strategies. Course content is developed from and matched directly to the ABIM Internal Medicine Exam Blueprint. These courses are backed by ACP's Board Prep Guarantee, so you can register with the confidence that you'll succeed. There are two courses for you to choose from with both in-person and virtual live formats. The Greater Chicago course beginning on May 23rd through May 27th or Washington, D.C. on July 11th through July 15th. As a special bonus, all new registrants will receive six months of access to the course recordings. Visit acponline.org slash imbr2022 to register or learn more. That's acponline.org slash imbr2022. This episode is sponsored by Green Chef. And audience, you know, Paul and I are huge fans of Green Chef because, as we've said before, we just like it when it's easy to make the right food choices because, as Paul would say, it's really easy to eat just hot garbage if he's left to his own devices. But with Green Chef, he gets hand-picked organic veggies and premium proteins. And no matter what kind of meal you're eating... Green Chef has you covered with things for keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, gluten-free. If you want it, they've got it, and they have an always changing variety with something new to discover each week. Green Chef is going to save you time, all that meal planning and grocery shopping, all that prep work. They have everything pre-measured. Everything's there for you. As I've said before, I love making these Green Chef meals with my family. I don't have too many skills in the kitchen, but I can follow the Green Chef recipes and I can look like a hero in front of my family and they love the food. My kids destroy these things. So what are you waiting for? Go to greenchef.com slash curb130 and use code curb130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash curb130 and use the code curb130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. To start us off here, Paul, did you want to read the first case from Cashlack and and get it going? Sure, I'm happy to. So we're going to be talking about the sad case of Mr. P. He is a 67-year-old gentleman with a history of high blood pressure. He's on an ARB, hyperlipidemia, prior MI, status post drug-loading stent placement, HEFREF, EF was 38% on an SGLT2 inhibitor, furosemide, carvedilol, He's presenting to our AD this afternoon with two weeks of worsening shortness of breath and lower extremity edema. The blood pressure on admission is 119 over 82. JVP is elevated to the mandible. Lungs with diffuse crackles bilaterally. Extremities are warm and well perfused with two plus bilateral lower extremity pitting edema. I think you see where we're going with this. Chest x-ray in the ER is consistent with marked pulmonary edema, the worst kind. Um, And admission labs are notable for a creatinine of 1.68, which is from a creatinine three weeks ago in the office of 1.02. So we have this patient who's got this fairly clear picture of volume overload in the setting of known HEFREF whose creatinine is elevated from above baseline. So I guess this is our jumping off point to sort of start our conversation about cardiorenal syndrome. So I guess, why don't, why don't we just start with the definition and then maybe we can take it from there. And this is, why don't we, um, well, I guess we'll ask Sadia first, since sure. your cardio parts first. And that is exactly what I was going to comment on. The cardio <laughs> part is first because the heart is the most important part in everyone's life. And so cardiorenal syndrome really emphasizes cardio first, but it really is a term that's applied to the interaction and this bidirectionality between the heart function and kidney function. And the fact that if heart function is impaired, there's higher risk for having worsening renal function. And when there's chronic kidney disease or injury, that may feed back and lead to worsening heart failure. Is it important? I know they break it down into all these different classification schemes. How important is that to to know the different types? How do you think about it when when you're just like, does this person have cardiorenal syndrome? That that's our question for this, Mister P, the guy that we just presented. 
I think one of the most challenging things is determining what the right treatment is. And so the breakdown of the cardiorenal syndromes into each of these five components can be a helpful framework to think about how can I identify what is happening and a little bit of the chicken or the egg phenomenon of what came first and how do I best manage it. And that's where I find the breakdown helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. So what you have is you have uh, the the four of the five are you have an acute decrease in kidney function, which causes heart trouble, or you have chronic decrease in kidney function, which causes heart trouble, or, and then the opposite, you have acute decrease in heart function, which causes kidney trouble, or chronic decrease in heart function, which causes kidney trouble. That's four of them. And then the fifth one is like something else happened and it knocked them both out, right? <laughs> and, that, and that's the five types. But the reality is in terms of hospital medicine, where you come in and you have the patient with acute decompensated heart failure, 100% of those are type 1 cardiorenal syndrome. And I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about saying 100%. Sadia, am I pretty – is that does that feel right? I think that's the majority of the cases, and that really helps you better understand what the driving factor often is and whether or not the kidney is a bit of a bystander sometimes. So for a guy like this, I think what happens is he comes in, and especially if it's someone earlier on or not as comfortable, they haven't seen seen this too many times yet, they see that – elevated creatinine, and they immediately want to stop the SGLT2, the the ARB that this person's on. They want to, they don't want to give diuretic because we're worried about worsening the creatinine. And, um, we, but we're presenting a case where clearly we think the patient is volume overload. So Sadia, what, what's your advice to those people when they're seeing this kind of patient? I think one of the things is that is to sit with that fear and be able to work through what's causing it rather than freezing in the face of fear. And that can be the second worst thing that happens is when you do nothing. And then the mo- the worst thing that could happen in a situation like this is to try to give someone IV fluids or try to rehydrate someone that's fluid overloaded. Yeah. So let's talk about, Joel, the, the physiology of this. I know you love physiology. Do we actually understand what's happening with cardiorenal? I always just thought it was like, Poor forward flow, but then when you actually read about it, uh, I, like I learned this in the past few years, that that's it's more complicated than that. But tell us what's the current thing? Yeah, your your evolution is the exact evolution that the whole field went through. Like the 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 standard teaching was this is a decrease in cardiac index. You have decreased flow, and that's going to cause your decreased kidney function. And what we saw when we actually started looking at the data, when we started doing analysis and looking how patients were responding, what correlated much better with this decreased kidney function was uh, increased venous pressure, getting that venous congestion, essentially back pressure on the venous side. You know, because remember, all you know, perfusion of any organ is going to depend on the difference between the arterial side and the venous side. And what was surprising to us, we always thought it was a drop in the arterial side, the arterial pressure causing the decrease in, in perfusion of the kidney. But it actually was this, we think now, increased congestion, increased back pressure on the venous side that slowed down congestion, which slowed down perfusion. And that just, it immediately walks you right to the therapeutic option, right? If the, if the problem is too much venous congestion, we have drugs to relieve that. And, and, and what's so rewarding is it works, that these patients do get better. Their creatinines do come down when you give them uh, diuretics, which is so counter to kind of every other, every other type of AKI that we deal with. This one definitely feels different. And just to add on to what Joel was saying, I think one of the other things that's really helpful to try to recognize is that most patients who are coming in with decompensated heart failure, whether they have HEFREF or HEFPEF, actually have a preserved cardiac index. So even in the setting of reduced EF or systolic dysfunction, the majority of these patients have a preserved cardiac index, and that forward flow is not the driver for their decompensation. Mm-hmm. The, how about the blood, like the systolic blood pressure? The, I, I think that's, that is still important though, right? Like if the person's just straight up hypotensive, that's, that's still a problem. We're talking mostly like in, in patients that are more normotensive, it's the venous back pressure that's the big, that is impairing the perfusion. Is that fair to say, or is blood pressure at all involved? Similar to the concept that the fact that forward flow and cardiac index is relatively preserved, most of these patients have a normal to hypertensive response when they're decompensated. But totally agree with you. If the blood pressure is low, if someone's frankly hypotensive, and importantly, hypotensive relative to their baseline, then figuring out what's causing that is just as important as getting fluid off. 
Right. And that's going to be a more complex case where you're going to need to start focusing on onotropes and, and being a little bit more intensive rather than just uh, 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 unloading them. Yeah. What we've talked about so far is that there's a bunch of different types of cardiorenal syndrome. Most of them are a little bit of a, did the heart do this or did the kidneys do this? And then uh, there's the one type that's just like something else knocked them both out. And we think that this venous back, this venous congestion or increased venous pressure is impairing perfusion. And that's probably the bigger driver driving force than, than a, a cardiac index that's low. Um, but blood pressure still, they still need to have relatively a, a good blood pressure or or that could be in play. Is there any any big parts of this that I'm missing, uh, Sadia? No, but I think I'm going to take one to the, for the team and blame the heart. I think the heart is usually at fault. <laughs> and and we're, you know, I guess the good news is I, most internists feel pretty comfortable uh, treating a patient who comes in with acute decompensated heart failure. At least not if they're if they're not in the CCU. Maybe if they're in the CCU, that that could be terrifying. Uh, but a lot of the times, patients come in on the floor and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm, my weight's up a bunch. I was a little more short of breath." And like, they're not that worried. I'm not that worried. I just know it's going to be a little bit of a long road. And uh, so that's what I think about Paul. Are we missing anything here? Is this uh, anything else that confuses you about this situation or the the pathophys before we move down to the next part? No, I'm just, I find myself deeply reassured that the classification system I can largely disregard. So that makes me feel good. So I just want to thank you for your blessing for that, for the both of you. <laughs> okay. So I, I actually have a question. So my hospital, we don't have SGLT2s as inpatient drugs. Are those available where you got at, at your version of CashLac? <laughs> at your local CashLac hospital? They, yeah. So I will say they are not. I think if patients bring in their own medicine, you know, you can do that thing like patient may take own medication. And then I think SGLT2 still, remembering back to what uh, our perioperative guru, Avi Talo Glasser, has taught us, I think if the, if anyone's going to go for a procedure or an operation, they want them off for two or three days. And I think that really limits the inpatient. I think that makes people a little skittish about using them inpatient. But Sadia, what about at your at your cash lack? What are they doing there? We do have access, and I think one of the most exciting news of today was that the FDA just approved SGLT2 inhibitors for heart failure regardless of ejection fraction. So that's probably going to be one of the most important things in my practice where the majority of my patients have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And are you using them for acute decompensated heart failure? We are when we can. It It is a little bit of a, I think as Matt was saying, a little bit of always a um, back and forth and figuring out when's the right time, but trying to do it on the way out the door. Oh, okay. So, but in, in the in the anticipation that this is something that's important for outpatient therapy, not not part of your armamentarium for this is how we're going to tackle his acute decompensated heart failure. Plus minus in cases of diuretic resistance, I think that's where it can really be helpful to start him earlier on. But trying to see when the right time is in the um, various GDMT regimens that we're getting started. Yeah, I have I have one memorable patient where they were had tremendous diuretic resistance, and I was it was it was we were throwing the kitchen sink at them. And one of the things was they brought in their home SGLT2 inhibitor, and and sure enough, the patient started doing better. But I I never knew which one of the sixteen things I did that day actually caused them to do better. Right? I was like, maybe I don't know. <laughs> But at least you didn't do nothing. That's why they got better. <laughs> yeah, it was the opposite of nothing. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's just say. Actually, I want to ask Paul a question before we move on to conclude this case. Paul, how often do you see that like patient comes was in the hospital? They were on all these great meds before they went in, and then they come back out to you, and and, and they're missing like a lot of important drugs. Yeah, well, constantly. I mean, that's this. This presupposes, I guess, some kind of discharge summary. But let's pretend, in the best of all possible <laughs> worlds, I actually have discharge paperwork that actually reflects the hospital course and the discharge plan. To go all the way back to your question, it's still very common to have medications held, understandably, because of fluctuations in renal function, and then just not restarted prior to discharge. And so, it's a lot of a lot of things are happily deferred to the PCP, even things like ARBs, but including SGLT twos and even sometimes diuretic adjustment. Weirdly, so it's. There's a lot of stuff I see that just kind of falls off the list um, as they're waiting for the patient to equilibrate that is deferred to PCP follow-up. Yeah. So let's let's say that we get Mr. P. He's in the hospital. We realize he's volume overload. We give him IV furosemide. 
actually creatinine starts to get better. He starts to feel better. We're, we're going to be discharging him. And at that time, if Sadia, if his if his ARB and his SGLT2 were held during the admission, and uh, like, would you tell people they should start them now the creatinine's back to normal, starting them on the way out the door, or if the creatinine's not quite back to normal and they don't get started, how soon should they be restarted? Like, when do you want those patients to follow up to make sure that th- that this doesn't happen again? ASAP. I think the sooner we can get them restarted, the better. And honestly, before discharge is a great time because patients are often overloaded with lots of different information, lots of changes that are happening. And so if we can go home with a regimen that's going to be stable, that could be the most helpful thing for the patient as well. And if they have a lot of blood pressure, that they're not hypotensive and they're not hyperkalemic, and you know that the mechanism of the AKI is from D, is is cardiac. I'm not sure why we're stopping the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers to begin with, right? That I know it's the reflex. I know you see that AKI and you want to pull those off. But if you take a look at this guy globally, you know, a little afterload reduction is not going to happen. It's right. probably a good idea here, right? Yeah, you're right. So right. I, what I'm hearing is in a case as clear as the one that we presented here, creatinine's up, but everything's screaming volume overload. We 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 don't necessarily have to stop those medications. We can continue his ARB. We continue the SGLT2. Give him the IV furosemide. Uh, get him decongested, and the the creatinine should start to get better. We can keep those on. But if we if they are stopped for whatever reason, start them on the way out the door. Make sure that they're they're not just like they don't fall off. It's like the opposite, Joel, of like someone gets started on a PPI in the hospital, they're on it forever. This is like, <laughs> this is the opposite. No, it's the same thing. They stop it in the hospital and it's it's off forever. It's, yeah. it's it, the, the amount of therapeutic inertia is incredible. Yeah. All right. So I think we've successfully gone through the first case here. Paul, let's let's move on to the second case. And just because I like to hear you uh, read things, why, how, about, how about you go through this and start <laughs> us off with the next one? Oh, well, then you are in luck. I will read this thing. Um, let's talk about Ms. O, which is fantastic Dresden doll song. Anyone? No, that's okay. <laughs> We're, none of us um, are cool enough. Well, I'm sorry, yeah, everybody. Well, I <laughs> Speak for Paul, yourself, man. I'm definitely not cool enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's like or old enough. one and a half listeners that are <laughs> oh, pretty yes. stoked about that reference. Ooh, shots fired. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enough cash abuse. Ms. O is another patient that we are caring for on the floor. She has a history of long-standing hypertension, hyperlipidemia, HFPEF, and was admitted three days ago for acutely decompensated heart failure. Her BNP was 3,000 compared to a prior 1,500, and her high-sensitivity troponin was 0.47. In the past, it has been 0.57. Just for reference, normal is less than 0.11 by our uh, cash slack lab. Since admission, you have pursued aggressive diuresis with a reduction in her volume overload, though she continues to appear marginally hypervolemic on exam this morning, and you are continuing to diurese. Her creatinine was 0.8 on admission, which is around her baseline, and remained relatively stable during her first few days in the hospital, though this morning you noticed that her creatinine has now bumped all the way up to 1.25. So we have this patient that we're working on slowly but surely, um, maybe seems to be improving clinically, but now we notice that her creatinine is, is up a little bit. How much should we panic at this point, and what do we do with this this change in her creatinine, Sadia? I think the most important lesson that we learned from the last case was do not panic. Do not give in to fear, right? And so perhaps one of the most important things about how we interpret creatinine is that it does not equate to kidney injury, right? A rise in creatinine does not mean the same thing as acute kidney injury. I think that's... I think that is a confusing thing and something that I only started to think about in the past few years. A, a lot of it was I've heard Joel and other people and people on Twitter talking about this this creatinine bump and how it's it it sort of sometimes scares us off from what we think is the right thing to do, which is giving diuretic and trying to decongest the patient. Yeah, it's it's strange for as common as acute decompensated heart failure is in the hospital, in terms of well done large trials, there are too few of them. And one of the relatively recent well done trials is called the DOSE trial. And it was a the the primary outcome or the primary question was bolus furosemide versus a infusion drip. And there was no difference between the two, but there was a lot of uh, post hoc analysis that came out of that. And one of the ones that was really impressive looked at uh, what happened to patients whose creatinine went up or creatinine went down 
in that study in terms of long-term outcomes. Uh, I think it was 60-day readmissions and mortality. And what they found was people whose creatinine went up actually did better than people who didn't have their creatinine change or went down. So and please. don't you think that's because they just got better diuresed? We know one of the most important markers for how well someone does when they lose, leave the hospital is how dry were they when they left? Because too many people leave the hospital still congested. And, and this is the kind of classic patient that it happens in, right? They've, got, they've gotten mostly better. They're probably breathing all right. You're still detecting congestion on your exam, right? It says that they still think they're a little mildly hypervolemic. But that bump in the creatinine kind of scares you. And you're like, okay, that's probably enough diuresis. We'll, we'll finish this in, in the outpatient when really what you need to be doing is like, let's finish the job, right? Let's, make, let's get this patient back down to their, their uvolemic state. It, it sounds like it's more of a clinical endpoint, like the, you want the patient feeling better. And if you know, if you can tell the patient still has extra volume, either by previous weights or just by examining them, then we should keep going, even if the creatinine starts to bump a little. Because when I, when I was trained in the, uh, you know, this is now, I can think back 15 years ago as a student, they were like, oh yeah, we diuresis until the creatinine bumps a little bit, then they're ready for discharge and we send them out. But if, if you go by just that, you might be missing a patient that doesn't yet feel back to baseline and doesn't yet have their weight back to baseline. You're doing half the job. Yeah. That's right. So that's what, the, and that's that concept of this permissive hypercreatinemia is that our job is not to monitor the creatinine. Our job is to make the patient better. And if the creatinine has to rise to get there, so be it. Yeah. It, Joel, I've heard people talk about, I just want to do a little bit more probing around the creatinine. I've heard people say that when these folks come in and they're really volume overloaded, you're not getting a sense of their true creatinine. And then as you're, can you talk to that a little bit? Right. Well, I mean, you know, when they're volume overloaded, there's <laughs> their blood volume is going to be increased and that's going to dilute down their creatinine to some degree and removing a lot of that uh, blood volume as part of the decreasing their extracellular cell volume is going to concentrate that creatinine, right? We see that with red cells all the time. We talk about the hemoglobin getting hemoconcentrated. The creatinine is going to be no different there. They're, that'll be affected by kind of those same forces. So the fact that the diuresis actually results in a creatinine value that is higher than when you started, it's not even that the creatinine has changed. It's just that the blood volume has changed and that's translating into a change in the value you're seeing. Perfect. And then the one other thing I wanted to talk about, I've also heard some of the nephrologists say this, is that the creatinine lags behind by about a day. Joel, can you, is, is that something that you think about? Is I, I've heard people say it. I, I don't, didn't fully understand. Right. I mean, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about in acute kidney injury is that, that uh, creatinine is always a lagging indicator. Like you'll have the injury on day one and you may not see a bump in the creatinine to day two or to day three, depending on how that patient is handling. Like it's just Trying to use it as a real time indicator of GFR is just a, it's a, it's a lost cause. It's not something that you should be trying to do. But one of the things that Sadi and I are trying to get at is that there are hemodynamic changes in creatinine based on just the, the moment to moment perfusion of the kidney that don't represent intrinsic damage to the kidney where you're going to be actually causing uh, acute tubular necrosis and causing damage to the glomeruli or the tubules. Um, and, and we're, and we're trying to, and we, <laughs> unfortunately, in most situations, we can't separate those two out. But in this case, when we're really pushing diuretics and we don't have hypotension, we don't have, you know, sepsis, we don't have other things that can be causing injury. What we're really just seeing are these hemodynamic changes. And these are all completely reversible. They're not causing any permanent damage to the kidney. And we need to go through this uh, to get these patients back into uh, the uvula mixed state where they're going to get optimal cardiac function. So I, I think one of the things that I think about is that I, one of the reasons that we like we being internists like the creatinine so much, I won't even project, I like the creatinine so much is because like Matt and I are always looking for just a number to tell us what to do. And I think volume status can be challenging in a lot of patients, especially even subjectively how they're feeling. If they feel fairly bad at baseline and then they have these exacerbations and they feel kind of worse, even then you're sort of in this nebulous area where you, you don't really know how they feel better. So I guess this is my long-winded way of asking, uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask Sadia, what, what are the, when you're looking at patient volume status, what are the examination, like what, what, what do you do to sort of best associate a patient's volume status? Are there any exam findings you find especially helpful? Well, I'm not going to let you take all the glory as an internist for <laughs> wanting a number that's going to tell you what to do, because I think cardiologists kind of own that domain. If you think about every biomarker that 
has ever been created is our way of saying we need one simple answer. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. And I think the patient that you describe is really the majority of people that are kind of slowly getting worse oftentimes, and you're not quite sure how much worse it is from their baseline, how much more diuresis do they need. And a lot of times it's really hard to assess volume status. It can be really challenging in a lot of patients. And some people don't really have right-sided volume overload, so you don't see a lot of swelling in their legs. You can't always assess their JVP very well. So that's a long-winded way of answering your long-winded question, which is it's incredibly difficult. And you know, one of the kind of last resorts, but maybe it shouldn't be such a last resort, is going for invasive hemodynamics. So doing a right heart catheterization, looking directly at the pulmonary artery pressure. And I think as we expand our use of implantable PA uh, pressure monitoring devices, that might be a way, and particularly in patients with chronic kidney disease who have even more difficult uh, volume status assessments might be useful. We've been building that program out for both our HFPATH and HFREF patients. And I found it so beneficial, especially for our HFPATH patients, where it's exactly what Paul was describing. You've got people that have a lot of baseline symptoms and have these kind of blips continuously. It's tough. And Joel, we talked about this way back when where they took all these expert nephrologists or maybe cardiologists and they tried to have them do a volume status exam on patients that were close to uvolemic. And they were like a coin flip is, is when they, whether they could predict if the volume was up or volume was down. So I, I what I've come to rely on is just the history. And I, I do utilize a little bit of POCUS. I think Paul does too. Uh, we you can So you can look at uh, the JVP. We we talked about that on a episode that hasn't been released yet at the time we're recording this, but will have by the time this releases and people hear it. And uh, so I use the, the ultrasound of the JVP or looking at the lungs for beelines. You know that that adds some information along to the history. The exam can be tough because, like you said, Sadia, there it's not not everyone has edema or you can't always see the JVP up. So it it's. It is, I think, a tough thing. And unfortunately, you just have to rely. I think everyone's looking for that one physical exam or one test that's going to tell you. But as far as I know, there isn't one. And we've asked a lot of people this question. And we always get the answer that people sort of go by gestalt based on multiple things, not just one thing. Uh, In a number of these studies, when they've done, um, I think there was a radio labeled albumin trial where they were really looking at volume status carefully and they looked at the time of discharge two-thirds of the patients still had volume overload. So I think that the gestalt that most of us use results in us under-diuresing our patients. Yeah. And so if you are if you think that it's close, probably go another day with that IV diuretic before, before knocking them down to orals. This episode of The Curbsiders is brought to you in part by Squarespace. You're listening to a podcast. I have to assume that you know what Squarespace is, but just in case you don't, From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Squarespace allows you to manage email campaigns so you can grow and engage your audience, create powerful email content that matches your website with your existing products, blog posts, and logo so your messaging is consistent and effective. Squarespace also allows for social sharing with their configurable sharing button that lets your visitors share content on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, StumbleUpon, God Help Us, Reddit, Pinterest, and Tumblr. ShareSpace also has analytics to allow you to gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site, how they're interacting with your content. They have in-depth analytics tools that include page views, traffic sources, time spent on site, most read content, audience geography, and more. If this sounds appealing to you, and it should, go to squarespace.com for your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash curb to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This episode is sponsored by Masterworks. You know something, audience? I'm a bit of an investment geek. I I like learning about finance, and that's why I'm so excited about this sponsor because as a primary care doctor, to me, prevention is very important. And when I'm thinking about my portfolio, I know that having it be diversified is very important to weather the ups and downs of a volatile market. And guess what? It's pretty volatile these days. We got wars, we got pandemics. And that's why I wanted to tell you about a surprising way to diversify your portfolio. And that's investing in blue chip art. 
Did you know that artwork has little correlation to the S&P 500? That means when the art markets react to something crazy that's going on in the world, which just seems to be happening continuously, art prices can help your portfolio hedge market volatility. That's why Wall Street Journal recently called the art market, quote, one of the hottest on earth, and with Masterworks, investing in blue chip art has never been easier. Masterworks is the billion-dollar fintech startup that now enables everyone to invest in iconic paintings from artists like Picasso, Basquiat, Monet, at an entry point that's affordable for you. The most exciting part, Masterworks is giving our listeners priority access to their newest offerings. Just head to masterworks.art slash curbsiders to get started. That's masterworks.art slash curbsiders. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. I wanted to move on and talk. We gave you this patient with a creatinine of 1.25, but let's say they had a little bit more of an advanced CKD. Let's say their baseline creatinine was 2.3 and they're coming in creatinine of 2.8 and the BNP is 3,000 which is like twice as high as it was the last time. And their high sensitivity troponin is 0.47. Last time it was 0.57. Sadia, what do you think about, does that mean that because the BNP was higher, does that mean their heart failure is worse this time? Like how do we interpret that in a patient with advanced CKD and heart failure? These biomarkers in patients with advanced CKD can be even tougher to interpret or maybe a little bit easier because you can do what Joel does and just ignore them completely. (laughs) Uh, But I do think the relative change in BNP is still helpful to us because an increase that in that relative change to me still suggests when you take the whole picture into account that there's probably volume overload. So it can at least tip us in the right direction, but it's not the end all and be all. Mm-hmm. Joel, the, the write up for Nef Madness was suggesting that both the troponin and the BNP they're not just completely removed by the kidneys. So they're not just elevated because the patient has CKD. They're, they are actually a sign. They prognostically, the patients with those markers elevated are have worse prognosis than patients who have normal markers. How do you think about it though? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the troponin the one, is the one that I've investigated uh, more, uh, uh, more extensively is that, you know, Residents are so used to seeing that elevated troponin. They're like, oh, it's a CKD patient. We don't need to worry about it. It's not informative. And that's actually not quite true. Like it's not informative in terms of putting somebody on the pathway of acute coronary syndrome, but it is informative in terms of like this patient does have cardiac disease. They are losing cardiac muscle. It's not just a lack of clearance by the kidney, and it is predictive of bad cardiac events to come, but just not in the next six hours, like in the next six weeks, right? And so, and and the problem then is it's it, no one's really sure how to what to do with that, and I think it's been made more confusing. There was a a trial a couple of years ago now called uh, ischemia CKD, which uh, took patients with advanced CKD who had symptoms, so some you know essentially stable coronary disease, but you know elevated, and they randomized them to an invasive or non-invasive approach, and there was just no difference in outcomes. There's no ad- additional benefit from that invasive approach, which is usually what you kind of want to do when you see that elevated troponin, or you say, "Oh, this patient's at very high risk. We should." do a heart catheterization. And we demonstrated that that didn't help those patients, that it ended up in it, you know, and it hurt some of them because the cardiac caths are not innocuous. Turns out caths don't save lives. (laughs) In some (laughs) circumstances, they do. Never thought I'd heard a cardiologist say that, but that's- (laughs) (laughs) You must be a heart failure doc. (laughs) (laughs) The only right caths are right heart caths. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) You can come back anytime. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but the distinction that I'm hearing here is it's not that it's not significant. It's just it's not That's directly exact, actionable. Yeah. It's kind of like it, it still means something, but you just can't necessarily do anything with it. Because it, otherwise, it sort of presupposes I'm just spilling troponins all the time. But because my kidneys are working okay, you're just you're not going to see it in my blood work, which also doesn't quite make sense to me. I think if we go upstream to what that troponin really reflects, one of the big distinguishing factors is whether or not it reflects epicardial coronary disease. So blockages that we would see when we cast someone that may benefit from stent or revascularization versus what's probably happening in patients with CKD, which is microvascular disease. So really more in the um, microvasculature that we know that there is 
damage, endothelial dysfunction, that this is reflecting underlying risk for future disease, but it's not an epicardial and atherosclerotic problem. I love that. I, I think I think people it, people just need to remember that these patients are very high risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. The, right, Joel? The patients with chronic yeah, kidney disease, yeah. they die more commonly Sterile. of cardiac disease than, than of their renal disease. But again, the, the when we say cardiac disease, we're so used to thinking about uh, STEMI and an end STEMI, and it's probably that's probably not what's happening in here. It's a, it's more heart failure and sudden cardiac death type picture in our CKD patients. So again, not the things that are immediately actionable. So it's cardiac disease, but not like cardiac disease in the in uh, in healthy normal kidney function population. And I think just to benchmark what we're talking about in terms of risk of death. Once somebody's hospitalized for heart failure, the risk of dying in the next five years is 50%. And if we think about a patient that has heart failure and chronic kidney disease, then that risk is even higher. And so I think that is really something that is very sobering to think about if we really want to think about what can we do to help these patients and not only help prolong their lives, but also help them live their lives with as few symptoms as possible. Well, Miss Miss O, we actually we diurese her. We don't just follow the creatinine. We follow the exam. We keep her that extra day or two. Get her feeling great. She's back to the the previous weight that she reported as her 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 low weight, and uh, we get her out of there feeling good. So we have another case, and now we're going to talk about more some diuretic resistance. Let's say we have a patient, Mister R. He's seventy two. He has hef ref. And um, he's admitted he has acute decompensated heart failure. His weight's up 20 kilograms. We've been trying to diurese the heck out of this guy for 48 hours, IV bumetanide, four milligrams twice a day. And he still just like seems like his weight's not budging. He's still on, let's say, supplemental oxygen. Sadia, what do you think about when you see this, this kind of a patient? I think one of the most difficult things to figure out is whether or not someone has diuretic resistance where despite being on the maximally tolerated diuretic dose, we're not able to achieve euvolemia or get someone diuresed. Usually, we're just under diuresing someone, and we have so many different options, not to throw the kitchen sink at someone, but a lot of times being able to complement diuretic strategies across loop, thiazide, SGLT2 inhibitors can really make a difference. Yeah. So, what what might you what might you recommend? Let's. Paul and I consulted you because we're we're just we're just uh, we we didn't we didn't know what else to do. What what would you do? What would be your next step for a patient like this? Um, let's just say creatinine is one point four, and um, we've been diuresing. Nothing's budging. Labs are okay. We're not running up against like hypokalemia or anything like that. Well, first, I'd tell you to go back and listen to yourselves on curbsiders during this episode, <laughs> and then you'd know what to do. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, that you, my Paul do you have a time note. machine? <laughs> I was, well, was going to say, listeners of the show will know that I don't listen to the curbsiders, so this is no problem for me. <laughs> Unless I force him to throw it for a recap show. <laughs> my epic note will contain a hyperlink to this show. Yes. Um, but in addition to that, Thinking about if someone's already on high dose loop diuretic like this patient is, and we're not seeing an adequate response, then layering on a thiazide and an SGLT2 inhibitor can be really helpful. Even though there was no difference seen between continuous IV infusion of a um, loop diuretic versus bolus dosing, one of the things that you can achieve with continuous dosing is getting a higher dose in a 24 hour period. And so it may still be helpful if you're trying to get to a higher dose. Yeah, and I think people need to be careful about saying that there's there, the dose trial showed no difference. The question they were asking was initial therapy. That was the when the patient first got treated with for their in, uh, decompensated heart failure, there was no difference here. But here we have failed kind of bolus dosing, and I think this is a kind of a different type of question. And I and I agree. I like going with a, a high dose loop. One of the advantages is increased higher total dose in terms of like 20 milligrams in 24 hours with this, with avoiding very, very high peak doses because it's the peaks that cause uh, the hearing problems in terms of the side I effects. See. Right. So if you, if you have them on a continuous infusion, you're getting a high total dose, but without those big swings, the peaks. Joel, you taught us way back 
20 times the creatinine is a good starting dose. So if someone's creatinine is one, 20 milligrams IV, IV furosemide should, should be able to do it. We've, uh, Eric Adler was another cardiologist, was a cardiologist we talked to. He said 40 times, uh, BUN times two, I think was the start, was a good, was a potential starting dose. And then there's house of God dosing, which is your age plus BUN. And usually if I get the house of God dosing, especially if they're 80 years old and, uh, I'm giving like 120 of IV furosemide, probably I would have tried to, uh, to add on a thiazide diuretic a, a, at that point. But if I get to that point, then I'm usually calling for help. Yeah. One of the interesting things about that is um, bumetanide doesn't have um, doesn't have the same kind of dose response with kidney failure. And so you don't need to make the big dose adjustments with bumetanide that you do with furosemide. So that really, those guidelines really are furosemide-based dosing. And for bumetanide, it's, it's way less affected by the GFR uh, than furosemide. I think one of the other things between the two that's really important is gut um, edema and how much gut edema someone may have, and particularly in our HEFPEF patients where they may be hiding a lot of their fluid overload in their bellies. Furosemide may often be ineffective, and bumetanide can have um, better bioavailability. And so in the preserved ejection fraction, you get more of the gut edema than you do with the reduced ejection fraction. That's yeah, we see a lot more abdominal edema, and it makes it even more challenging on physical exam. Interesting. I wonder if those patients are just more like a pulmonary hypertension phenotype or something like that. They're more more right sided. I don't know what the mechanism is. I'm just just speculating, but it's interesting. Yeah, and so and, and but here where you've already gone to IV, the bioavailability question kind of falls away. You're really talking about you know you're failing IV. You know that's of course that's the first move you want to do when you get them in the hospital. Skip. Out of you know, move out of orals and go to the IV mm -hmm. just to bypass the GI tract. And let's just so the audience, maybe maybe the audience members haven't started uh, metolazone or whatever thiazide you like to use. Sadia, what what's a good starting dose for someone? We gave you a patient that was already getting big doses of ibuprofenide. What might you add in as like a specific dose, and then how often do you change it? I usually start with metolazone two point five and do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type of approach and give them three doses in a week. Some people can have a very profound hypokalemic response to even just one dose. And particularly for our patients that are in the hospital with acute decompensated heart failure that maybe have a low EF and already have some ventricular arrhythmias, that can be pretty dangerous in the acute setting. So we want to be careful not to overshoot either, um, especially when we're frustrated and dealing with someone that's not diuresing at all. You kind of want to layer on and layer on. So watching that potassium. And one of the ways that you can kind of offset it is if they're not already on a mineralocorticoid antagonist, that a plerinone or spironolactone can also be a great add-on therapy. Right. So and Joel, the, we talked about this last time, right? Yeah. That, I was just going to say that there was a um, there was a trial and it was uh, diuretics versus um, an ultrafiltration device. Is that unload? Am I thinking, is that the name of that trial? Uh, Sadia? Yeah. And they had a stepped dosing for the diuretics that increased the, and they started with five milligrams of metolazone daily for people that are on less than 80 milligrams of Lasix as their starting dose. And then they, they had a stepped approach. If that doesn't work, then you go to five milligrams twice a day and they were, and they worked their way up. And so yeah, that's out and, there also. And, but, uh, and one of the things that, that Sadia didn't mention, but was implied in that is that th this drug is a long half-life. It sticks around for a while. Metolazone is, it's not like a furosemide that's gone in, in six hours. This stuff has, uh, I think it's 15 hour half-life or something like that. And as we talked about with Joel on our episode on metabolic alkalosis, when you're using the diuretics, if you start to see metabolic alkalosis, if you start to see problems with the like chloride, the potassium, you can give them potassium chloride. Spironolactone was one of the other agents, Joel, that you mentioned that we can we can use. And, uh, and Sadia just brought it up as well. So a lot of things in our armamentarium. So what I'm hearing is high dose loop diuretic given IV. Uh, thiazide, long-acting thiazide diuretic might be a next-line option. Um, we can consider SGLT2s, mineralocorticoid um, antagonists, and then, um, as I was mentioning, you know, make sure you you keep an eye on the potassium uh, to make sure that their potassium, their chloride are okay. And uh, anything else we're missing from from what you might do here? 
for oh, yeah, these patients there, with diuretic resistance? We, we have not gotten close to the bottom of the kitchen sink. Let's keep, let's keep going. <laughs> right. So there's um, uh, people use acetazolamide. So again, I don't have SGLT2 inhibitors available to me in the, in the hospital, but acetazolamide will also work on that proximal tubule. And if you're trying to do, you know, the, the concept of sequential nephron blockade, where you block the loop, but then the distal convoluted tubule reabsorbs the sodium. So then you add a thiazide there. And then the, the cortical collecting duct starts to reabsorb the sodium. So you add aldosterone antagonist there. <laughs> you can go all the way to the beginning and you can add acetazolamide at the front end to try to increase urine output. Just don't give the patient a soda afterwards, Joel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It will not taste good. <laughs> Uh, the kidney is so sneaky; it keeps trying to bypass everything you do. <laughs> yeah, and then um, something I've done a few times is uh, is uh, hypertonic saline. Have you have you done this, Sadia? I have not in my very young career. Reading about this, Joel, I, I in the Neff Madness Write Up audience, they talk about giving hypertonic saline to try to like induce a high. I I mean, Joel, explain it. I I don't even know uh, that I can s- succinctly explain it. So there is um, data out of Italy, which is uh, always should make you be worried about what's going to come out after that. There was an Italian study that once showed, right? But actually, <laughs> there's a number of studies. It's, I'm, I'm going to say that I wouldn't be doing it if it was just a single Italian study. There's a number of studies, but it, this stuff really <laughs> did originate in Italy. And they use uh, small volumes of hypertonic saline. So they'll give 250 cc's or 153 cc's of 3% saline. And uh, they, along with the diuretic, and it seems to reverse this diuretic resistance. And there's a couple of theories. One is the very high osmolality reverses your uh, neurohormonal, so it kind of resets your neurohormonal milieu and suppresses your renin, aldo- uh, angiotensin, aldosterone system so that you don't have such intense uh, sodium retention. Um, Maybe. Uh, or the other one is it pulls fluid in from the interstitium because it's very high osmolality and, and increases the arterial volume. Maybe. But uh, I have seen it work. It is a, I would describe it as a high risk maneuver because you are giving a lot of sodium to somebody who's in decomposited heart failure and everybody will look at you like, are you sure you want to do that? Right. And so I usually, before I do it, I tell the patients that if this doesn't work and we've already kind of failed every, and this is again, this is a, a last resort situation, at least in my hands, we'll probably be going to dialysis or some form of uh, extracorporeal therapy if this does not work. And I kind of use that as my um, emergency out. If this report work. back, let us know, but don't, if it goes bad, you didn't hear from us. I think that's a great point though, Joel. A lot of times these patients that have a low GFR and they've been hanging out at that low GFR range and not quite yet ready to start dialysis get tipped over with their acute decompensated heart failure. And that sometimes is the trigger to say, I think we just need to start dialysis or we're not going to be able to keep them out of the hospital. Yeah. Such a cool thing. Paul, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to try that one out, but very cool audience. Keep that one in your back pocket and suggest it. I Actually, this would be one of the ones I'd, I'd love to hear people on Twitter tell us if they've done the hyper diuresis chloride repletion before. That sounds pretty cool. So bragging rights if, you, if you've done it before. Sadia, this has been great. I would love to ask you for maybe two or three take-home points from what we talked about tonight. What do you want the audience to remember? And then Joel will go to you next. I think the most important thing that we covered is that creatinine is not kidney injury. So remembering that a change in creatinine, an increase, can be due to a lot of different things, particularly in someone that's overloaded and needs diuresis. I think our second comment was around biomarkers and the utility of biomarkers in someone who has acute decompensated heart failure, and particularly that the relative change in BNP can be useful. So if you know a baseline and you know where the BNP is now, And if that has increased, that can at least help tip you with the exam and the entire story together to say that someone is volume overloaded. And the third is, if you're not sure of the volume status, and I think we touched on this a little bit, is think about either non-invasive ways like ultrasound or invasive ways like right heart catheterization to get objective measurements. And it doesn't mean that you failed at the physical exam. We all have patients that are incredibly difficult to assess volume status, and it's better to know than to guess. 
Yeah, and I guess what I would lean into is, you know, taking care of the uh, acute decompensated heart failure that's on the floor in front of you is usually not that challenging, but your real goal is to prevent that next admission. And so make sure you completely decongest them before you send them home and then send them home on the drugs that we know prevent these episodes. Make sure they leave on their ACE inhibitor. Make sure they leave on their aldosterone antagonist or mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And if they're on an SGLT2 inhibitor, get them back on it as soon as possible. We are going to fade this into the outro. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy? <laughs> Just me and you, buddy. Get your show notes <laughs> at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest. I guess it's not so new anymore, but it still feels new. Recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify. Or you can contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to our producer for this episode, Malini Gandhi, and to our executive producer, Beth Garbs Garbatelli, who also runs our Twitter. Nora Toronto is the editor of The Digest. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. Tima Karganov does the website. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Claire Morgan of Notterly edits our audio. And finally, Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. Really strong work there, Dr. Watto. As always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>